Welcome to the award-winning Thoughts from a Page podcast, a member of the Evergreen Podcasts Network, hosted by me, Cindy Burnett, a voracious reader and book columnist who provides you with casual author conversations and book recommendation episodes, as well as insider information on all of the newest releases that I personally endorse and on the publishing industry in my behind-the-scenes series. With so many books coming out weekly, it can be hard to decide what to read, so I find the best ones and share them with you. For more book recommendations or to find my backlist of interviews, visit my website at thoughtsfromapage.com. Have you read a book recently that really resonated with you and makes you want to read a book more like it? If so, submit a read-alike request to me through my Google form located in today's show notes and tell me why you loved it, and I will suggest some similar reads on a future Tuesday episode. If you are interested in reading some great books before they publish, I hope you will consider joining my Patreon group to access additional content including early reads and pre-pub author chats and bonus episodes. For March, we are reading Fifth Avenue Glamour Girl by Renee Rosen. And for April, my selection is The Comeback Summer by writing duo Allie Brady. I just added Banyan Moon by Tao Tai for May and The Bones of the Story by Carol Goodman for June. The link to join is in the show notes. Today, I am chatting with Laura Cathcart Robbins about Stash. Laura is the host of the popular podcast, The Only One in the Room. She has been active for many years as a speaker and a school trustee and is credited for creating the Buckley School's nationally recognized Committee on Diversity, Equity, Inclusion, and Justice. Her recent articles in HuffPo and The Temper on the subjects of race, recovery, and divorce have garnered her worldwide acclaim. I hope you enjoy our conversation. And now for a quick break. For the last year, I have been focusing more on my health and eating habits. In connection with that, I have started drinking AG1 in the morning. When I started drinking AG1 daily, I could feel a real difference in my health and energy levels. That is because AG1 is a foundational nutrition supplement that supports your body's universal needs like gut optimization, stress management, and immune support. Since 2010, AG1 has led the future of foundational nutrition, continuously refining their formula to create a smarter, better way to elevate your baseline health. I recommend AG1 to all of my family and friends because the company has a team of doctors and scientists. It is tested for 950 contaminants and is NSF certified for sport. It is formulated based on the latest science, and it maintains high quality standards. Thanks, AG1, for sponsoring my show. AG1 is a supplement I trust to provide the support my body needs daily. If you want to take ownership of your health, it starts with AG1. Try AG1 and get a free one-year supply of vitamin D3K2 and five free AG1 travel packs with your first purchase. Go to drinkag1.com slash thoughts from a page. That's drinkag, the number one, dot com slash thoughts from a page. Check it out. And now back to my show. Welcome, Laura. How are you today? I'm great. Thank you for asking. Thank you for having me. I'm so glad you're here. I really enjoyed your story, Stash, and I can't wait to talk more about it. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Well, let's start out with you giving me the elevator pitch for those that won't have read it yet, and then we can dive into some other questions. I really need to work on my elevator pitch. (laughs) But basically, it is a book about a 10-month period in my life during which I got divorced, spiraled into an addiction, got sober, met a guy, and got home Really, I'm sorry, the through line is I'm really fighting to stay in my children's lives during this whole 10-month period. So it's it's the journey of me being an addict and then getting divorced and getting sober and what that all looks like. Well, how did you decide to write a book about it all? Let's see. There are, there are two reasons I decided to write a book about it. The, the first was that while this was happening to me, in 2008, I, I myself am a voracious reader. Like I read everything I've always read. I, I've always gotten my take on life comes from the books I read and how I respond to real life comes from the books I read. And it's just been that way for me ever since I could read on my own, which was about four or five. And so I expected that when I was going through this really like the most terrible time period of my life, that I would be able to find books that would guide me through it. And I did. I found books on getting divorced and I found books on getting sober, but none were written 
by women that look like me. And also my intersections at that time were addiction, race, and privilege. And I didn't find any books written by a woman of color coming from a place of privilege and and dealing with active addiction and divorce. So that was one of the reasons I decided to write it, just because there wasn't anything like it out there. And I I thought it would have been really helpful to have as I was going through it. The second reason is I've always wanted to write memoir. I had imagined myself writing about a, a much bigger swath of my life, like years instead of months. But each time I talked to someone who knew better about my story, it kept coming down to those those 10 months. So I just decided to to write about that and see where it went. And how long did it take from when you began to think about writing to getting the book in final form? So in in uh, summer of 2020, post George Floyd, HarperCollins posted something on Instagram saying that they would take 30 pages and a query from unagented Black authors. Uh, it was their response to the summer of 2020. And I didn't have 30 pages or a query, but I thought that was a sign that I should <laughs> get it together. <laughs> exactly. So I devoted myself. It was it was a June post. I don't remember what date. The due date was September 8th, I think. My birthday is August 27th. So I decided I was going to complete it and turn it in by my birthday, which I did. And I got an auto, you know, the automatic response back from my email that said, thank you for your fiction submission. And my heart sank because I knew it wouldn't be considered because it was memoir. It is the whole query was talking about how it's memoir. So that was September or that was the end of August of, of 2020. And I sent those pages to a friend of mine who's a New York Times bestselling author later, like a month or two later. And she looked at them finally and freaked out when she read them, sent them to her agent. And her agent called me and signed me the following day. And that was November of 2020. And I turned in the first draft to her in April of 2021. Oh my goodness, you wrote fast. I wrote fast. <laughs> and you mentioned a little bit of this in your acknowledgments about yes. giving it to your friend and then now you have the same agent. I didn't know it was that quick. Yes, it was that quick. It was it was unimaginably. I couldn't have wished for it to happen that way because it would have seemed impossible. But it is it is exactly how it happened. It was Holly Holly Whitaker is my friend, and that's the author I'm talking about. She she read it on a Friday. Um, she sent it to Rebecca Gradinger, who's our agent, on Saturday, and then Rebecca signed me on Monday. That's really amazing. Yeah. Yeah, it really was. And so fast. And so fast. <laughs> you know, you always talk about the publishing world and how slow they move. Yeah, so yeah. That is the opposite of that. Though I guess by the time you get the book written, you get it turned in, now it's being published. You know, that part's a little slower, but getting the agent, sure. that's a great story. Yeah, yeah. And 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 mind you, this was when I was talking about kind of sifting it down to this 10 months, I had written book proposals for a, a much bigger memoir and gotten rejected by lots of agents. <laughs> but this had been like 2016. So I hadn't and, and so I kind of gave up after that on that, and I didn't know what I was going to do. And then this is what happened next, was just taking a, a small portion of what I was proposing and writing about that instead. Do you think because it covered only 10 months, it was a little easier to write quicker? Or do you think you had already been thinking about it, or it was just easy to write quickly no matter what? Uh, I think two things. One, it was in the middle of the pandemic, so I didn't have any reason to go outside. So I was literally able to work from 11 to 7 every day. That's what I did. But two, yes, you're right, because it was a 10-month period, which, you know, it's an addiction memoir. I really shouldn't have remembered as much as I did, but I did write everything down during that time out of necessity. So it was very easy for me to write. I never sat in front of a blank page because I, I knew exactly what came next. I thought that was interesting because you referenced that in your book how you your memory itself wasn't that great because a lot of it kind of blurs because of the addiction. But yes. because you wrote everything down, it was easy for you to pick up the journal, the notepad, whatever it was you'd written on at the time and piece everything together. Yeah. And and in reading it, stuff came back to me. You know, it was it was stuff that I a lot of it I hadn't looked at since then. 
until I started writing Stash. But it was I was I was really impressed that the memories were still there somewhere. They were just waiting to be unlocked by these certain keys, which were the dates or the appointment, you know, uh, the name of the of the doctor I had the appointment with, and then seeing in my day planner what other events I had around that day. And I'm like, oh yeah, I remember that because I was in full withdrawal going to my PTA meeting and right after that doctor's visit or whatever it was. So that was really helpful. It's always so fascinating to me how tricky memory is and how you can have something you've not thought about in a decade, and then you look at your calendar, a song comes on, something or another, and all of a sudden, there it is. Yeah, yeah. It is It is really, really, it was one of the coolest parts of the process for me was having these things return to me. It was also a really painful part of the process because there were things that I hadn't remembered exactly how they happened. And then getting a better understanding of the events that were not my proudest moments was 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 challenging. Maybe rather those memories stay hidden. Yes, but but they didn't. Right, exactly. <laughs> That's unfortunately also the way memory works, right? Yes, yes. Well, I had no idea Ambien could be so addicting. And I guess that's just ignorance on my part. But when I started the book and I was like, well, I wonder what she was addicted to. And as I was reading, I was like, who knew? I guess many people, but I did not. No, I don't think. First of all, I want to, I do want to say that I, I actually think that Ambien is a really good drug when used as prescribed. I used it out of prescription, which is why I had the experience with it that I did. But Ambien is meant to be, it's meant as a reset for sleep, it's meant to be taken for 10 days, no longer in a row. And it's usually very effective that way. One, one tablet per evening for 10 days, and then you go back to some other kind of routine. I just really liked it. I liked the <laughs> way it made me feel. Right. And I, well, and you know, I, I illustrate in the book my, my journey with it, starting off with it as prescribed and then eventually, you know, just as many as I could get my hands on, basically. And adding it with alcohol once the Ambien wasn't as effective anymore. Yes. I learned in treatment that we call that boosting. Okay. I boosted it. I boosted it. I enhanced it with alcohol. Yes. Well, it has to be hard to think back on that time period, but it also probably has to have been healing to go back and write about it. I'm sure it was cathartic in some way. Oh, yes. Yes, for sure. There was there was definitely, I was making peace with myself along the way. I was telling myself, you know, that this was a time when I was very sick and I could look at it now as someone who was very well and and have compassion for myself then. So in in that way, it was absolutely cathartic. Good, because you hope when you can sit down and work through these things, write them out, that it will bring you some peace about the time period. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. That that was my experience with it. Well, I'm always so curious when people are writing memoir, because most of the time people's stories intersect with other people's stories. Mm -hmm. How did you handle that in terms of your family and your friends and including them in your story? So I change a lot of names, but my friends, I call them my sex in the city friends in the book. Right. <laughs> I checked with them. Only one of them wanted to see what I'd written before she said yes. And they all said, yes, you can use my real name. So those are their real names. My, my ex-husband, you know, that's a, that's a tricky situation, but, and I don't want to tell his story at all, but what I tried to do was to keep him as kind of a background figure in the story because I don't want to tell his story. But I did something that I know to be unusual, which is before it went to first pass, I let him read it. And that's not something that I've ever heard recommended <laughs> by another writer. <laughs> right. Well, I saw in your acknowledgments that you had at least spoken with him about it, but I was so curious exactly what that looked like. Yeah. That's what it looked like. And, you know, I, I had a variety of reasons for that. But the main reason is that we are still co-parents to our now grown sons. And a lot of the book is about kind of the the way that he and I came to this this place in our lives where we wanted to be, we wanted to raise them without drama, without them 
you know, having to worry about what they said about dad when they were with me or about me when they were with him. And I think that he and I were really successful. We, we, we celebrated their lives together. Even after we got divorced, we did our, we didn't, we never did like two birthday parties. We did the same Thanksgiving. Like we, we just did everything together for them. We were always at every school event together. For a long time, people at school didn't even know we were divorced because oh. <laughs> we just kept showing up together. And, and I don't want to, I didn't want to make that messy. And I, I think I wrote very respectfully about him, but you know, it's, uh, that's my opinion. And so if there was something that he felt was disrespectful, I would have been willing to, to change it. Not a lot, mind you, but if there was like one particular thing that he would have said, Oh, this is too intimate, or I feel like this is disrespectful. I had lots of stories during that time period. I probably could have replaced something. So that was my thinking was that if there was something that really stuck out to him that, that felt like it was hurtful, that I, I didn't want to hurt him. So I would, I would change that or remove it. But, but it, that wasn't the case. He, he just, he was very supportive and wished me, wished me well in publishing. Well, I obviously wasn't a part of your relationship, but in reading about it, I felt like you were very respectful when you talked about him. And even without, you know, a lot of spoilers, even when you all were working through your divorce, yes. you were trying very hard to keep it not contentious, you know, to keep things mm -hmm. staying together, to be able to, as you said, deal with your children, yes. co-parent as best you could. So yeah. I would think when he read it, he was thinking, oh, you know, she handled this very well. And I mean, he's a public enough persona as well that you're, I'm sure, wanting to just make sure there's no problem there. Yeah. I mean, oddly enough, we are both very private people, which doesn't, isn't obvious for, for me <laughs> since I write about my life all the time. But, but like if you're my friend, if you're my good friend, you probably don't know that much about my, my romantic life or, you know, or religion or finances. Like I just don't talk about that kind of thing with anyone. And he's a very private person. So I wanted to, to, I'm, I'm doing something that's out of character for both of us by exposing this part of our lives to the world. And I wanted to make sure that I was, like I said, like I was respectful and, and keeping in mind that he is a public figure, but a private person. Exactly. Well, I think you succeeded and it sounds like he agreed. Yes. What about your sons? <laughs> My sons. <laughs> I just know having three children of my own, they're not yeah. grown, but one, I mean, one of them is almost 22, one is 20 and one is 17. And yeah. so I was just kind of curious. I wonder what this was like for her. Well, you know, I sat them down. So first of all, my sons have, what they remember about me the most in their lives because I got sober when they were little is me being in recovery. So my journey in addiction and recovery is no secret to them. They know mostly all about it. but. You know, I sat them down when I said, I'm, you know, I've written this book and it's, it's been sold to one of the big five publishing houses, which is fantastic at auction, um, which they didn't know what that meant, but that was okay. And <laughs> but you're like, it's a really big deal. I promise. <laughs> it's a really big deal. And, and I said, I want to tell you what it's about because I don't want you to be blindsided. And I'd love for you guys to read it if you want. And so I started telling them what it was about. And, you know, my younger one kept eye contact with me for a while, but my older one was immediately like on his phone and like, they love me. They, I see them all the time. One of them's here right now, but they just didn't really care. <laughs> they didn't well, that's really, great. I mean, yeah. that's the best thing about it then, you know? So I brief them, you know, as best as I could. I think their girlfriends are reading it right now. Their respective girlfriends. So they may get more of a window into it from their point of view. But, but I have over and over and over again kind of prepped them for this. And they just, you know, like, will you help me fill out this application? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Let's move on from this book thing. We've got stuff yeah. we've got to do, Mom. Yeah. Well, and they were young. So they I mean, were. it's not like they were going to be a large part of the story then. Obviously, they were because they were your children. But I mean, right. there weren't a lot of interactions that you had to detail. No. No. And I, and that was also intentional. Right. Right. I, I tried to make them background characters as well, even though they are the focus of my journey. Right. The whole thing you're trying to hold on to is your children. 
But I can see that in the midst of all of that, again, you don't want them to be front and center. And I'm sure they didn't want to be, or maybe they don't care. <laughs> right, right, right. So right, right. As of right now, they don't seem to care at all. So well, that's perfect. Yes. Well, what surprised you the most when you were writing Stash? Well, I'll tell you this. When when I got sober in, in 2008, you know, I talked about being a voracious reader and, and writer, which I, I forgot to mention then too. I wrote every, I, I wrote every day. I wrote something every day. And I, I lost that ability after I got sober. And I thought, okay, you know, I've heard about artists, you know, musicians, singers, other writers kind of having a dormant period after getting sober. It's like, like the body's winter, right? Or the spirit's winter and spring will come and you'll start writing again. And, you know, you need to heal from all this trauma first. But about five years in, I started getting really scared that I wasn't going to get it back. And I, I started taking classes. And this is also in the book, but I didn't graduate from high school. I never went to college. So books are my whole education. <laughs> like reading the books I did were my education. I had not had any success in a classroom setting, you know, other than, you know, middle school prior to that. So going to UCLA Extension and these other writing classes was really, were really daunting for me. But I did because I was scared if I didn't kind of, you know, exercise that part of me, I would lose it forever. And so I spent several years kind of just taking writing classes and not feeling very good about my writing. So I think the thing to answer your question that really surprised me was how much I liked my writing as I was writing this book. Like I felt like I had my groove back and like, and, and also it was pouring out of me, but not just pouring out of me in, in the way that it was formed in my head onto a page. Like it was really the way I want it to articulate it is how it came out. And like the, all the sensorial stuff that I was able to grab onto and, and put on the page, which I really wanted to, but I was, I was, quite surprised that I was able to. That's wonderful. I don't really write. I mean, the only things I write are like book reviews and book columns. Mm -hmm. But I even find like in my head when I'm walking or something, I'll be drafting something and it sounds so great. And then by the time I go to sit down, I'm like, the dog was there. You know, and so I mean, (laughs) so the fact that you can get it down like you like it, you know, immediately is is impressive because I find that very hard to do. I will have, I mean, I just what I need to do is use the notes app and people say that all the time and I don't. But I'll have these beautifully crafted sentences and then I just can't get them out by the time I sit down. So that's great. Yes. I mean, it it still takes me a week to write an Instagram post. (laughs) Right, exactly. (laughs) (laughs) I have all these drafts of those saved on my phone because they're not quite right. But But Stash, it did. It just poured out, like you said, the way I wanted it to. I love that. Well, what about the title and the cover? Oh, the cover. I love the cover. I do too. Yeah, thank you. Um, The title was probably the 19th title. And I had come up with a couple of different titles that I really liked but felt too long and weren't, they just weren't it. Like I knew they weren't it, but I didn't. Like the thing when I write articles, the thing I'm worst at are the endings and the title. Like that's the, those are the hardest parts for me. The rest of the article I can write, but the endings and the title I have a hard time with. And, but I was looking through someone, I can't remember who this was and I'd love to credit them. They, they said, go through the book and see what you do and what you think most often. And your title might be in there. And so I thought about like my kids, because that's what I'm thinking about most often. But what I did was stash everything. Right. I had stashes all over the house. They were so important. I couldn't have survived. They were survival for me. But then what I thought about, you know, again, thinking about her question, was I had stashed pieces of myself away my entire life. You know, when my stepfather was irritated by the way that I was authentically, I stashed any part that I thought might be annoying away. I did the same thing in my marriage. I did the same thing, you know, in my career. And, and then in order to survive this being living as this version of myself that I created, I had to stash drugs and and alcohol all all over my house in order to survive. So stash, uh, I have the, the, the memo pad that I wrote it on. Um, and then circled it and underlined it and underlined it. And then I emailed Rebecca, my agent, 
with just that word. And she called me on FaceTime and she's like, yes, that's <laughs> it. We have it. <laughs> we have it. So so that's how the title came about. My editor was equally pleased with the title and we came to her with the title written, but she she also loved it. And and then the cover, that cover was the second iteration of of the covers that they so I know that a lot of people, a lot of authors have, you know, 20 or so covers that they go through before they find the right one. The first one was was bright orange, which I didn't mind at all, but it had these little drug daisies on it, like they were daisies made out of pills. And I hated it. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, that seems really random. It seems really random. It didn't seem, there was no culture in it. Like it didn't feel black at all, which right. I thought was really important for people to know that this was written by a black woman and without having my picture on it, which I didn't want and wouldn't have sold any books, I'm sure, because no one knows who I am. I mean, they kind of do now, but it's not enough to sell as many books as I want to sell. I wanted to convey that this was not only an addiction memoir, I wanted that to be on the cover, but I also wanted to show that there was some culture involved here. And, and you know, the thumbnail version of that cover, it would have just looked like daisies. You wouldn't even be able to see that they were drugs or they actually were vitamins, which I also objected to. <laughs> <laughs> can't use vitamins. Like, what is going on here? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So I, I, you know, my agent tells me this is really unusual. I was very specific about my responses to the cover and what I liked and what I didn't like. I liked the brightness of the orange. I didn't, I also did not like the font. It was very thin and square. And again, it just didn't look like my book to me. So I, I found font that I liked, which was from the old black exploitation films the Foxy Brown and Coffee, like those black exploitation films of the 70s. I used that font because I thought maybe somebody will say, oh, that was, that looks like those letters from those black movies. <laughs> oh, that's really cool. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It also happens to be the same font from the original Valley of the Dolls book. So there's that throwback as well. It's It's very, very similar subject matter. So that that worked out for me very nicely. I thought the pink was just another bright color they tried, and I ended up loving that. The the pills all over the cover, that's what they did with the notes I gave them, and they did way better than my notes offered. I mean, they really they really killed it, I thought, with and making one of the 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 O's in my name mm-hmm. yeah. one of the pills. I love that. And covering some of the title, like the H has a pillow on it, the A is partly covered. I just think it is so well done. And then the fact that your hand is on there or someone's hand, but the fact that it indicates you're black, I think that is, I was thinking about it earlier this morning, actually, when I was looking at the book and kind of reviewing it before our interview. And I thought that's genius. I I think so too. And and actually the the art director for for Atria Simon & Schuster just kind of did that as like, let's see if this works and shot with a model that looks like she has my hand. <laughs> it's like, I mean, when I hold up this book, it looks like it's my hand on the cover. It's crazy. And I love the fact that there's this, this nice big rock on her hand. So you can see that there's privilege. You can see that there's marriage. You can see that she's reaching. There's uh, the French manicure and she's reaching for a pill. Uh, so I, I just, I love everything about it. And of course, um, my dear, dear friend, Holly Whitaker's quote is on the front cover, her blurb for my book. It was the first blurb that came in and yeah, I love it. I love the cover so much. Well, and then I was looking at the back and Christy Tate's blurb is on the back and I just interviewed her earlier today about BFF. Yes. Yes. Oh, I love Christy. She, she was a guest on my podcast and I'm actually doing an event with her for BFF at Book Soup here in Los Angeles. And I cannot wait. I haven't met her in person. So this will be our first meeting in person. Oh, well, that's great. Well, I looked at that and I thought, what are the odds? The books are coming out a month apart, but I literally interviewed you both on the same day. And I loved her (laughs) book just like I loved yours. So that's so fun that you're doing an event together in LA. Yeah, I'm so happy. I'm so happy. And that's really cool that, that you interviewed her today. That's awesome. Well, let's talk a tiny bit about your podcast before we wrap up. The only one in the room. Yes. The only one in the room is is the offspring 
of the first article I had published, which was in October of 2018. I wrote about going to Cheryl Strayed and Elizabeth Gilbert's writer's retreat, Brave Magic. And I was there for three days. It was a 600 person event. And I was the only black one there the whole time I was there. No way. Yes. Yes way. And wow. I, I met the women from my writer's group in person for the first time. We're all over the country. They're all white. And so we decided to do this together. The event, the retreat was amazing. Like I had the best time, but I, I write about I had this very dual experience because I was also very aware of being black the whole time. But I was also among, I was a writer among writers as well. So there was the, those two things I felt very a part of and very separate from. Wow. But like on the second day, I, I said to them, I said, you guys, I think I'm the only black person here. And they all said in unison, you are. <laughs> <laughs> so they had noticed it as well. They had noticed it as well. That's just crazy. One in 600. I could definitely see feeling yeah. the duality of that. Like it's such a great community, writers and all of yes. that. But then also feeling like, why am I the only black woman here? Yes. Yeah. A person. And and including the people that work there. Person. Yes. Yeah, sorry. I was thinking all women, but yes, yeah. you're right. If 600 no, there were, people- there were 11 men. Okay. So black person, not just black woman. <laughs> but you're right. It's mainly women. It's it's the kind of thing that women go to. And right. Yeah. So I wrote about it when I got back. Um, I was actually writing like- um, a piece for a, a a class I wanted to take. And you had to write a thousand word essay for entry to be considered. So I decided to write that for entry into this class. And she wrote me back and she goes, one, you're accepted. And two, get this published this weekend. This is incredible. So she gave me a list of places to send it out. I had never done that before. I hadn't anything published. So I sent it out. Emily McCombs at the Huffington Post like got me back right away. And she said, is this still available? I want it. I want to publish it like tomorrow. So she did. And it went viral. A lot of the responses I got, I got like in the first few hours, I got 568 direct messages, which was also like, what? I was, my mind was blown. Wow. Right. And they were from people, all races, all over the world, all ages saying basically like, I know what it's like to feel alone in a room full of people. I thought black people would get it, but like everybody got it. And then a lot of them were hashtag the only one in the room. I love that. Yeah. When we decided to create a podcast a few months later, I thought that should be the title and the responses were the stories that we should tell. So every week someone comes on and tells an only one story, either where they felt like they were the only one in the room or they're the only one who's done this. And it can be like the only caregiver in the room for an aging parent or the only one whose kid was on scholarship at their private school, or, you know, certainly the, we have a lot about race, but, and we have a lot about sobriety because that can be a very othering thing, but it's just all kinds of stories. And, and it's so much fun. I love interviewing. We get so many submissions. I'm actually having to put a hold on them right now because I can't get through all of them, but I'm so grateful for them because we get all these incredible stories. So that's, that's the podcast. We tell only one stories. I love that. That's so creative. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to have to give it a listen. Please do. Please do. Well, before we wrap up, what have you read recently that you really liked? Okay. So you spoiled one of mine. <laughs> I wondered. <laughs> because I'm reading BFF by Christy Tate, which will be out, I think it's out, is it February 7th? Yes, I think it's a month before yours because you're March 7th, right? Yes, yes. yes. So February 7th, um, but you can pre-order it before that, obviously. I'm reading Laura McCowan's Push Off From Here, which actually has my same pub date. So we are both March 7th. Laura is the author of We Are the Luckiest, The Surprising Magic of a Sober Life. She has an incredible community called The Luckiest Club. And so that's another book that I'm reading and right now, because I'm interviewing him this week, I'm reading um, Matthew Quick's We Are the Light, which he's the one who wrote the Silver Linings playbook, um, which was made into a movie with Bradley Cooper and J. La, Jennifer Lawrence, <laughs> like what's the real name? <laughs> right. <laughs> um, and Robert De Niro and Chris Tucker. So he, he has a new novel out that's fascinating that is, that is actually out on stands now and is available to order. A very topical story. Yes. 
Yes. Oh, you're familiar with it. Yes, I've read it. <laughs> yeah. So definitely it is relevant for today's world. I mean, especially right now. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's true. You're right. It's just today's world because the, the topic is daily now, yeah. unfortunately. Sadly. Yes. Sadly. Yeah. Well, this has been delightful, Laura. I'm so glad that you joined me today on the Thoughts from a Page podcast, and I can't wait for everyone else to read Stash. Oh, thank you so much, Cindy. Thank you for having me. And, and talk about like creative ideas for a podcast. This is amazing. I'm so glad you're doing this. And thank you for doing this. Well, I love it when you were talking about how much you enjoy interviewing people. That is just my favorite part. I have met so many fabulous people doing these interviews, and I've read so many books that I'm not sure I would have been exposed to. It's yes. just been the absolute joy of my last few years. Oh, well, it shows. It definitely shows. You're great at it. Oh, thank you. Well, good luck with everything. Thank you. Thank you so much. Coming up on 5-Minute News, I'm Anthony Davis. You might think it's partisan because maybe it's critical of one side or the other, but it's not. It's just the truth. And I think that's also something that's kind of unusual for Americans listening to the radio or to podcasts because the news landscape in the States has been so partisan for so many decades. So 5-Minute News is verified, truthful, independent, unbiased and essential world news daily. Thank you so much for listening to my podcast. If you like this episode, and I hope you did, please follow me on Instagram at Thoughts From A Page. Consider joining my Patreon group to access bonus content and support the podcast. Tell all of your friends about the show and rate it or subscribe to it wherever you listen to your podcasts. I would really appreciate it. The book discussed in this episode can be purchased at my bookshop storefront and the link is in the show notes. I hope you'll tune in next time. History is complicated. The story of human progress is long, messy, and riddled with controversies big and small. On Conflicted, we dive headfirst into history's most infamous events and contentious figures. We try and untangle the good from the bad, the fact from the fiction, and the monsters from the misunderstood. Was Genghis Khan a murderous butcher or a civic pioneer? Did the allied powers go too far? in firebombing the German city of Dresden at the twilight of World War II? And how did the Marquis de Sade acquire such a sinister reputation? And was any of it true? These are just a few of the tough questions we wrestle with and investigate on Conflicted. So if you love history or just enjoy a good story, please join me, your host, Zach Cornwell, for a fascinating new topic each and every month. Conflicted, a history podcast, is available on Spotify, Apple, or wherever else you get your podcasts. I hope to see you soon.